death of someone we love who is seemingly in the middle of their lives is profoundly difficult. The moment we learn that that death came at his own hand, in a moment of despondency, that frankly is the most difficult of all. It can send those who love Scott into a depth of emotion that you've never experienced before. A real odd confluence of emotions. There's uh, sorrow and sadness, of course, but then there's anger, as John said. It's, it's unavoidable. There's grief, but there's also frustration. There's that sense of pain that you always feel in death, but there's also a feeling of rejection. There's sympathy, of course, that we always have. Then there's a sense of guilt. That juxtaposition of feelings is not one you normally experience at a, at a funeral. Not unless it's a funeral like this. Death by suicide is always going to leave a series of questions that most people don't need to grapple with. But we do. I could come up as the preacher and spill a bunch of platitudes and we could move on and ignore it. Or I could try to be helpful the way the scripture always seeks to be helpful. When Paul's addressing death in the scripture, he says, I don't want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who have died. Whatever the situation is, the Bible is uh, into revealing the truth about those things. Not sidestepping them, not overlooking them, not ignoring them. I mean, the truth in that sense always sets us free at some level. The first myth that affronts us in times like this is that suicide is the unpardonable sin. I mean, we've all heard that. And it certainly is not without people standing in pulpits throughout the centuries and telling you that. That's the unpardonable sin. You take your own life, it's over, you go to hell. You've had centuries of priests telling their church congregants these things. You see, the truth is that the people that preach those things have never seriously read the Bible. They listen to one another preach, but they don't really open the pages of Scripture because they make a distinction between sins that the Bible never makes. They talk about sins that irritate God, and we can commit those, and you might lie, you might gossip, you might lust, and then die, and, well, then you'll be okay. God's grace will cover that. But then there's another category of sins, and those sins alienate you from God. You may have grown up in a church that taught these things. You need to understand that is not what the Bible teaches. There are not some sins that just irritate him and some, some sins that separate you from them. The Bible is very clear that all sins separate us from God. All sin. The Bible does not make these distinctions. I preached countless funerals. And I can assure you that every single person that I have interned in the ground at a cemetery died with sin in their life that was not confessed and not dealt with. I assure you of that. To make an artificial distinction between what kinds of sins God deals with this way and this other set that way is just not what the Bible teaches. So I don't care what you learned as a child, and I don't care what they say on television. And it doesn't matter what some theologian wrote in a book. If the Bible doesn't teach it, we, uh, we reject it. All sins separate us from God. But you see, the embracing of the free gift of eternal life deals with all of our sins, past, present, and future. Real Christians get all their sins forgiven at one point in time. We've heard of his testimony, not just from Pastor Pete, but several have spoken of his faith in Christ. At the moment of that true faith in Jesus Christ, all sins have been nailed to the cross and forgiven. I'll debate any seminary grad on the topic of the distinction between sins that just is not found in the Bible. 
Another lie you'll hear is, well, if he were a real Christian, he'd never get that despondent. I mean, no one would get to that place. If you really were a Christian, you would have hope. I mean, you'd make it through those times. You would not choose to end your life. Real Christians don't get that despondent. Well, again, I'd have to say to people that say such things, I I guess you haven't opened the pages of the Bible to read about some of the most godly men that we've ever heard God comment on, like Moses, who God defends to everyone and says, here is someone I speak to face to face. Whenever they threatened Moses, whenever there was a, a, a a kind of relational coup in the Bible, God would step in and say, no, no, that's my guy. And Moses, if you read his life, reached the bottom on more than one occasion said to God I cannot go on anymore I'm done Job is another that God himself testifies to as a godly man a blameless man in his generation and much like Moses with a tremendous sense of opposition that he felt gave in to these feelings of total despondency and without the intervention of God he would have taken his life it was the same for Job A very serious illness, the loss of his loved ones. He sat there and was as suicidal as anyone has ever been. Prophets like Jonah. Things didn't work out in great disappointment in his ministry. Take my life. And Jonah, you may know the story of Jonah. So, well, he's not not that great of a prophet. How about this prophet, Elijah? I mean, you're really going to say Elijah is not a godly person? Not a person who knows God and has a relationship with God? When the authorities turned against Elijah, he sat under a tree and he said, I'm done. I'm going to die here. Were it not for the supernatural intervention of God, he would have ended his life right there. No, godly people can be despondent. Godly people can reach rock bottom. Godly people, I could go on to speak of throughout the scripture, can make horrible decisions. God does call all four of those men that I spoke of, to find other options. God does step in and say, listen, there is strength that is available. You've got to take hold of it, but you need to make it through this. God often, even when the Apostle Paul said he despaired of life, God said, listen, there are people nearby, and they can help you. Those things are not as common in our society. I guarantee you this lie will come your way. Scott is not responsible for this decision. He was despondent, depressed. This one may not feel as comforting to you, but the Bible is very clear about the dignity of the human person. We're not animals. We're not rocks. We're not trees. We're endowed with what theologians have called a hazardous, hazardous free will. We have something that gives us opportunity to make some devastatingly bad decisions. No, Scott is responsible for this bad decision. There's no doubt about that. The Bible would not in any way give him a pass. In empathy, we recognize and can be sympathetic about the pain. But we have to still append responsibility to the decision. There may be many things that help explain what happened, but there's nothing that excuses what happened. While many would want to excuse Scott from his responsibility, the most devastating thing that can take place in this room is when you begin to assume responsibility for it. That's the fourth myth. In some way, I'm responsible for Scott's decision. We have those close saying, well, look at the text messages here. We just heard that. Well, I'm sure there's that, there's that moment. Well, what if I had texted just the right thing at just the right time? What if I had called? What if I had said this? What if I had done that? What if I had changed something? And uh, maybe this is partly my fault. When someone close to us takes their own life, We can certainly learn something about how to deal with each other, but we cannot take responsibility for someone else's decisions. We can. And it would be a perfect lie of the enemy to put that in your lap and say, would you take some responsibility for this? It is not your responsibility. When anyone else in this world makes a sinful decision, the one who is responsible is standing before God right now. 
You ever wonder about that passage that says he'll wipe away every tear? I thought we weren't supposed to cry there. The eternal state that Christ died to secure for us will certainly provide for us joy. And there will be that. That will be the permanent state of those who have trusted in Christ. But it doesn't all begin that way. As Paul wrote to the Corinthians, he says this is a time of evaluation and a time of responsibility. And the way he put it is stewards will stand before their master and give an account and answer. God is not going to call you to give an account for preventing this. That's just not the case. And when you lie in bed in the darkness of your own room and you start to think in reflection tonight or next week, what could I have done to prevent this? I just need to tell you that needs to stop. That's not God, it's not constructive, and it's not truthful, and it's not right. There's a cloud that hangs over funerals like this that just doesn't feel like others because I wish we could celebrate the way they do in other funerals. Well, that's the other myth, that this last decision of Scott's defines his life. I just want to deal with that myth for a second. Satan is a liar, father of lies. He'd love to get you to believe that. Yeah, I understand this feels different than most funerals. But I hope you understand that his final act does not have to ruin your memory of him. And you don't have to pretend it didn't end this way. And you don't have to come up with a platitude to try and explain it away. Sin is, as I often define from this platform, things not as they ought to be. And this is not how it ought to be. But just as there's many things in your life you would hope we would not focus on at your funeral. I hope that you do not define Scott's life by one of his sins that just happened to come at the end of his life. Can we remember, and I know we're trying to, but let's affirm that what happened was wrong, but now let us focus on the 99.99% of his life. You and I are sinners. I'll bet there's some real big sins if I threw your sins on the screen that it would be embarrassing. But you know, that's the great thing about Christianity. We trust in God covering. That's what the word atonement means. Atoning for our sin and granting us forgiveness. And you know what the Bible says? When we sin against each other, we need to be like God. Imitate God in this, the Bible says, that you would learn to forgive as he forgave. He forgave us. And now it's time for us to forgive him. Even as John talked about his anger. I, we're all angry. We should be at some point if you're being honest. But we can get rid of that and at least start the process of that, letting go of that. By deciding right now on this day, at this event, we are choosing to forgive. Just as you would want everyone surrounding your life to forgive your biggest sins, right? And certainly that's what Christianity is all about. We're going to forgive Scott's final decision and remember the many good decisions that he made. Not overlooking his final decision, but remembering this, that an earlier decision in his life made all the difference about his final decision. He's decided to put his trust in Christ to see himself as a sinner and to repent. And the Bible is very clear that that act pins all of his sin in a metaphorical way to a cross 2,000 years ago that pays the debt for him. Past, present, and future.